Good morning everyone. Um, this is the little video where I would solve um, I think four yeah four questions exercises to time series starter. You can find the questions themselves on Blackboard as well. So let's get cracking. Question one issues that we have estimated a particular AR process and you're given the, uh, the results so you know the parameters already you know that you can achieve or obtain these estimate these parameters by OLSS this is an uh, AR process upon 3 times y t minus 2 plus epsilon uh, t and uh, we know this is a stationary process the coefficient sum to less than 1 so that's all that's all good. We also know a few observations and particular we know that the observation at time period 100 was 1.8 and the observation at time period 99 was 1.7 and at 98 the observation was 1.4 so the question is now what is the expected value for one period ahead at period uh, 100 given information and this should now be a this should be a capitalized y because we're using um, the information set so we'll just make sure this uh, this is a capital given information at time period 100 and then we also want the two step ahead forecast but let's start with this one so we'll start with straightforward uh, thing we'll replace uh, y101 with our process just written down for time 101 so that's 0 0.2 plus 0.5 times y t minus 1 that would now be time uh, y100 minus 0.3 times y t minus 2 that is 99 2 lags relative to 101 is 99 and the error term at time 101 so firstly we so we should realize that what we have here is this guy it basically has just been replaced by the process equation okay that comes from from up here just that process written down for time 101 so now we got to evaluate these expectations we know that expectation for constant is just 0.2 <clears throat> and then we have the expectation of 0.5 times y100 of course y100 is already part of our information set because that includes all information up to observation 100 so we don't need expectations we actually have the observations so 0.5 times y100 that's here that's 1.8 times 1.8 minus 0.3 times again expectation y99 given information at 100 we have the information that's 1.7 1.7 now plus the expectation of the error term at time 101 given information at 100 uh, given our usual assumptions on the error term that is just going to be zero okay so that means we just need to calculate what we uh, what we have here we have 0.2 plus 0.5 times 1.8. Ah, uh, okay, hang on. Let me see. Uh, 0.5, not minus. Mm, I need to, uh, let, me, let me clear that. Um, 0.2 plus, and I think I need to use these parenthesis here. I'm not quite sure this calculator does the proper prioritization, but it's got parenthesis, so that's fine. Minus 
0.3 times 0.7 and the solution is 0.59 so that is equal to 0.59 now the second forecast we want is the two step ahead forecast uh, sorry, one or two given still information available at time 100 We'll do exactly the same as before. So I'll do that quickly. 0.5 y101 negative 0.3 y100 plus the error term at 102 given information at 100. So that's what we need let's just see where where we go with these expectations so the constant can again come out then we have the expectation of 0 0.5 the 0 0.5 is a factor that can come out the expectation of y101 given 100 minus 0 0.3 times the expectation of y100 given information at 100 of course we have that information again that is 1.8 plus the expectation of the error term at 102 given information at 100 that is going to be zero expectation of a future error term is going to be zero so now we just got to establish what this guy is here but we actually just calculate that up here okay so that's going to be 0 0.59 so with that info we can uh, go back 0 0.2 plus what is it, plus uh, 0 0.5 times 0 0.59 minus 0 0.3 times 1.8 okay and then we have so that is let's see how we can do that on the top of our heads that's uh, 0 0.275 is that right um, no that's not right um, Nine five, of course. Here we go. It's sometimes not too bad to just practice a little of your calculation still skills and minus um, or point uh, three six or point five four or point five four. And what do we get here? That is 0 0.495 minus 54. That is negative 0 0.045. Now, I don't trust myself 100%, so let's just make sure that is right. 0 0.2 plus, this is of course huge potential for embarrassment. Five nine minus all point three. Ah. Minus all point three times one point eight. Here we go. Yay. Okay. So that's right. So here we go. This is uh, the result for uh, for A, we'll continue on to uh, to B. The question is, if you had forecast the expected value of 100 given information at, and this is now the new bit here, observation 99, what would your forecast or prediction error have been? So first we need to calculate this. And this is just you know quite straightforward again so this is 0 0.2 we just have to be careful with the information set 
times 0 0.5 times y99 minus 0 0.3 times y98 given information at 99. Uh, again, of course, or you see given the information set, we know both of these uh, both of these values for y. So this is very straightforward. That's 0 0.25 times 0 0.5 y99 was uh, 1.7 and y98 was 1.4. 1.7 and 1.4 so that's 0 0.5 times 1.7 minus 0 0.3 times 1.4 now given our well, my previous success with calculations I'm emboldened now this is going to be 0 0.85 uh, minus 20, 20, 20, 20, 42 minus 0. 42 so we have 1.05 1 1.65 I think that's 0 0.63 so that was uh, the actual forecast for y given 99 of course now what is the actual realization so that's just to make that clear repeat that again that's y 100 given Ninety nine, and the actual observation at time one hundred was equal to one point eight. One point eight. So our general relationship is y at a certain time t is equal to its predicted value plus the error term. Now this guy was just our AR2 process here. So now we have ooh, yeah, it was in 1.88, it was just 1.8. 1. Uh, 1. So here we have 1.8 that was 0 0.63 plus so that was a prediction so that means that the error term we should write at time 100 that uh, the result the remainder is the error term and of course we can easily calculate that that is 1.8 minus 0 0.63 is 1.17 okay so that would be our actual error term that would, would have been our prediction error for period 100 had we forecast period 100 in time period 99. So the second question is about forecasting using an MA model. So let us write down facts we have. The second question we have an MA model again I give you the estimated parameters and you know as this is an MA model the estimation of these parameters is not as straightforward as in an AR model so that is an MA model of order 1 again we are given some information at times 134 we have observation negative 0.8 at 133 at negative 1.1 and at 132 we had negative 1.4 and also there's an additional information it says and a trusted colleague tells you that using this model the observation of period 131 was predicted precisely i.e. zero forecast error so I think what this, uh, no, I know what this implies is that for period 131, our error, our predicted error, was equal to zero. 
okay so that's what this information says so now the question is calculate the expected value of 135 given information at 134 all information available at 134 and then uh, we want a second a two step ahead forecast as well so let's again play this with a straight bet okay we again just replace the uh, y135 with basically the process definition written down for period 135 so that means we have negative 0 0.4 plus 0.5 epsilon t minus 1 so that would be epsilon at time 134 plus epsilon at time 135 given information at 134 so the constant can come outside again then we have plus 0.5 the factor can come outside the expected value of 1 3 4 given information at 1 3 4 plus the expectation of this error term 135 given information at 134 and that of course means that the expectation of that is zero so th this is the guy we are after now this is the guy we need in order to be able to forecast forecast one period ahead and then it's obvious if you look at the specification we just need the one period ahead error term ah sorry the one period lag error term now do we have this no we don't so let's see how we uh, how we obtain that term let's start with writing the model down for period 134 because that will involve the error term of 134 so we'll just have we'll, we'll have to get back to this okay we'll have to complete that we know this is going to be 0 point, negative 0 0.4 plus 0 0.5 times something and that will equal a result so we know we are after this something now so, so we write down the model specification for 134 so that's negative 0 0.4 plus 0.5 times the epsilon at 133 plus epsilon at 134 and we'll rearrange this now for the epsilon term 134 equals y134 plus 0.4 minus 0.5 times epsilon 133 so that means to in order to calculate this error term at 134 what we require is the error term at 133 of course we don't have that so we can now write this again basically we can do exactly the same for 133 I jump immediately to the result because we know what this is going to look like it's going to be exactly the same just with different time periods for that we will require 132 so we'll re so we will have to write this down again now why do we have any hope of finding a solution here well you see whenever we go back one period we introduce a new lagged error term but we know we were given the information this information here that the error term at 131 was equal to zero so we'll just have to go as far as we need to go to get this epsilon 131 on the right hand side um, and we see we don't have to go much further than we have already gone so it's just one step four further 132 equals y of 132 plus 0 0.4 minus 0 0.5 
times epsilon at 1, 3, 1, but we know that the estimated the estimated value for this was equal to zero. Okay. Now this was an estimated value that means that really now we have to put a hat over here as well. But now we can calculate this guy. Okay, so this guy is gonna be y at one three two and we have that observation that is negative one point four. So that's gonna be negative one point four plus 0.4 minus 0 0.5 times 0. So that's just what it is. So that is going to be negative 1. That means this guy here, the estimated value, is going to be negative 1. So we can now go back to this. y of 1, 3, 3, we know to be negative 1.1. So we have negative 1.1 plus 0.4 minus 0.5 times negative 1. Okay, that was this result, this result here. And what is the result here? So we have negative 1.1 plus 0.7 uh, plus 0.5, so that's negative 0.2. Let me just confirm that again. Over here we have plus 0.5 plus 0 0.4 is 0 0.9, yeah, negative 0 0.2. So this now gives us an estimate for epsilon 133. And then we can go back to this one here. And we get y134, that is negative 0 0.8 plus 0 0.4 minus 0 0.5 times this estimate, negative 0 0.8. Two, and what we get is negative, negative 0 0.4 plus 0 0.1, so that's negative 0 0.3. Is that right? Let me just confirm that. Negative 0 0.4, yeah, negative 0 0.3, so that used the estimate of 133, that was an estimate of 134, and that is exactly what we needed. Okay, so this guy here is what we needed here. Okay, so now we can insert that result here, negative 0 0.3. And uh, what we get is negative 0 0.4, negative 0 0.1, so that is negative 0 0.55. Yeah, okay. So our expected value, one step ahead forecast, is negative 0.55. Now we've also been asked to calculate the two step ahead forecast. Again, we, which is all this sort of intermediary calculation. So we basically have to, to write down our model just so this is what we need, y of 1, 3, 6, given information at 1, 3, 4. And it's going to be equal to the expectation of negative 0.4 plus 0.5 times epsilon 1, 3, 5. That's one period lag relative to 1, 3, 6, plus epsilon 1, 3, 5. Six, and all of this given information at one, three, four. So that's too much. I'll come back. Here we go. Okay, and this is in fact pretty straightforward. Again. Expectation of a constant, just negative 1.04 plus. So now we have the expectation of 0.5 times the error term of 135, given information of 134. Of course, that is zero. And 0.5 times zero is zero. And plus the expectation of 136, error term of 136, given information at 134, again, that's going to be zero. So the result here is negative 0.4. 
and this is a quite this highlights a quite general point about AR uh, about moving average processes. Let's go back to our process equation. Here we had an MA1 process. Now, if you forecast more than one period ahead, all we're going to end up with is this guy, the constant. Everything else will be zero. Okay, that's for an MA1 process. You can imagine that if we had an MA3 process, say, then that effect would kick in if you forecast more than three periods ahead, then only the constant will survive. So we, here we had an MA1, that means if you forecast more than one period ahead, as we've done here, okay, 136, using information at 134, we just, uh, we are just left with the constant. So earlier I said I would have, oh, I didn't want to do this, that I would have four questions. Actually, that was incorrect. Uh, as you can see from the question sheet, I only have three questions for you today. So here we go. Here comes the third question. So we have an AR process. In this case, I call it XT equals 0.7 XT minus 1 plus 0.3 XT minus 2 plus epsilon oh actually here yeah, it's called U plus UT. So this is an AR2 process if we look at the two parameters we realize they are some they sum to one so this is a non-stationary AR2 process. Now well the question is now show that this can be transformed into the following form delta xt equals a xt minus one plus b delta xt minus one plus c delta x t minus 2 plus u t. This is also called the um, the augmented Dickey-Fuller form and this is, uh, we will only do this on uh, Monday, we'll talk about this on Monday the 28th so if you watch this before Monday the 28th we'll possibly not quite understand the full implications of this so it's possibly best to wait with this until after the 28th of November. So, and I want to know later what, how these parameters A, B and C, how they relate basically to these parameters up here. So, how, go, how are we going to achieve this? So this is the this is the goal. Okay, we'll just disregard this. This is what we want to achieve in the end. We'll start with equation one. Okay, or we start from here. Basically, what we're going to do is have I left myself enough space? We're going to subtract. Going to subtract negative x t minus one from one. Now why are we going to do this? Remember, so what we want to achieve here is that on the left hand side we want to have delta xt. Now delta xt is of course nothing else but xt minus xt minus 1, the change in xt. So to get delta xt from equation 1 on the left hand side we just have to subtract xt minus 1. So we'll subtract xt minus 1 from both sides of the equation. That means we get on the left hand side we immediately get delta xt on the right hand side we get 0.7 xt minus 1 and now I'll subtract here, it doesn't really matter where I put it but it's the most obvious if I put it here and then plus the rest of the equation. Now we can see we have xt minus 1 twice here so this is the same as 0 0.7 minus 1 times xt minus 1 so that's negative 0 0.3 xt minus 1 plus 0 0.3 
x t minus 2 plus ut. All right, so now it's not quite obvious where to, where to go from here uh, immediately. But it's possibly best to work with, you know, we, want, we, ha we have an aim. What do we want? If we s compare that to what we are, want to end up with, the ADF form. So we have delta xt already on the left-hand side. Let me copy that here again. We actually have xt minus 1, which is the next term here already. But then we don't have, we still have xt minus 2. But what we want is delta xt minus 1 and potentially delta xt minus 2. So what do we need to do to achieve, to, to, get an, to get basically a delta xt minus 1 term here? Remember, let me just write this down here. Delta xt minus 1 is of course just xt minus 1 minus xt minus 2. I hope that just fit in to the screen. So we have this xt minus 2 here, we have the second bit. So in a way what, what we need extra is an xt minus 1. So this will we'll do a little trick and that's quite common here. We add and subtract the same term. Okay, so that means we are not changing anything. We add and subtract. What do we subtract and add? Well, I suggest 0 0.3 times xt minus 1 because then we can combine these two, the new term and that term, to a delta xt minus 1. So we'll add and subtract 0 0.3 times xt minus 1. So, where does that lead us? Let's start again, negative 0 0.3 times xt minus 1 plus 0 0.3 xt minus 2 and then the plus and minus, so we'll start with the minus, 0 0.3 xt minus 1 plus 0.3 xt minus 1. So these two guys would of course cancel out, but we don't want to do that. And we would have just undone our good work. So why does this help us now? Because we now have a xt minus 2 and xt minus 1. So this can be put together so we can if we factor out a negative 0 0.3 of these two, we are basically now working on these two middle terms. Okay, we'll leave, well, we already copied the first one, we leave this guy alone. So we factor out negative 0 0.3 and I turn around the xt minus 1 and xt minus 2, we get xt minus 1 minus xt minus 2. Um, and then we just copy the last term, 0 0.3 xt minus 1 plus ut. So let's just confirm that this, these two guys are the same. We have negative 0 0.3 times xt minus 1, that's fine, that appears, that appears here. And we have negative 0 0.3 times negative xt minus 2, that's plus 0 0.3 xt minus 2, that's what we have here. So that's the same, but of course that is 0.3 xt minus 1, 0.3, and this is of course nothing else but delta xt minus 1. And we have plus 0 0.3 xt minus 1 plus ut. So what we've now achieved is that we have also that delta xt minus 1 term here. Now of course you can see we have negative 0 0.3 xt minus 1 and 0 0.3 times xt minus 1. So these two guys cancel out such that we are left with just 0 times xt minus 1 minus 0 0.3 delta xt minus 1. Now you see from our target we also want 
um, delta xt minus 2 but really the coefficient in front of that's going to be zero we've done everything we can do here and therefore we have the solution we know that the coefficient a is going to be equal to zero b is going to be equal to negative three and c is going to be equal to uh, to zero So that was indeed uh, actually part A of the question. And there's a second part, part B. And the question in part B is, what is the significance of um, testing following hypothesis H0 that a is large or equal to zero and the alternative that A is smaller than zero. Let's see how we came up with this uh, with this value A. Okay, let's think go through our calculations again and see how we established A. Okay? A, we started, let's think of what happened to this, to the coefficient to the xt minus 1, because that's what our coefficient is. We started with 0 0.7, that was just our initial coefficient. Let, let me just to, ah, well, we can start with, uh, with the numbers. So we started with 0 0.7. But then what we did is we, as we subtracted xt minus 1, or 1 times xt minus 1, what we calculated in the end was 0 0.7 minus 1. And then eventually what we also did is, remember where was the next coefficient of value to of factor to xt minus 1 introduced that was here when we added and subtracted uh, 0 point negative or when we added 0 0.3 times xt minus 1 now what was 0 0.3 that was the coefficient to sorry, plus 0 0.3 that was the coefficient to the um, to the second parameter. So in other words, what we have here is 0 0.7 plus 0 0.3 minus 1. Now you can see that these are the two AR coefficients. Let me just call them phi 1 and phi 2. Uh, if these were the, uh, AR coefficients. Now if we had, and you possibly have to take that on trust uh, from me at this stage, if we had an AR3 process, the value of A would be calculated exactly in the same manner, just that potentially there would be another phi 3 added in here. And if we had an AR4 process, we would also add the phi 4. So basically what we have here is the sum of all the AR coefficients minus 1. Okay, and that will always be the same. So, and if we use this information, we can interpret the, the H. Basically, what we are testing, if this is 0, if the value for A is 0, that means that the sum of the AR coefficients are equal to 1. So the a equals zero bit, let me just let me just make that equal to red, that is equivalent to non-stationarity. So in the null hypothesis here we basically have the parameter combinations for the AR coefficients that 
ensure or yeah that ensure that the process is non-stationary all the coefficients sum up to one now what is a what's the alternative hypothesis a is smaller than zero well that means that the sum here is smaller than one because then we have something okay this guy if that is smaller than one then minus one the whole thing will become remember that is a will become smaller than zero so the alternative hypothesis is equal to a stationary process so basically this is this hypothesis is used to test whether a process is stationary or not and we talked a lot in the lecture that this is absolutely crucial uh, when uh, uh, estimating regressions with time series data and this is in the end this is what it call what is called the uh, ADF test so the second part of the question now is look what we have here when you estimate this process so we can estimate let's just go a little bit up again okay we could estimate this ADF regression we have a dependent variable delta xt and as explanatory variable we feed in xt minus 1 delta xt minus 1 delta xt minus 2 and we can do this by OLS could we apply just a t-test on this coefficient okay we know this is a restriction on one coefficient we just discussed what the implication of this coefficient is it tells us something about stationarity or not and my question is can we just apply a t-test and again if you know from the lecture notes so the answer to this is no because that and um, if the null hypothesis is true that means if a is indeed equal to zero then the xt minus one so this variable is non-stationary if h naught is true and that means that we are preaching we have a preach of one of our assumptions okay remember we needed all the regressors to actually be stationary for our less to work properly and inference to work properly so since this is not true we can't just apply a normal t-test to that we can apply we can calculate a t-test but we have to compare it against critical values that do not come from the t-distribution they have to come from the dickey fuller distribution but we've discussed that in the lecture okay so these were all uh, the questions I wanted to talk to come to the exercise class and you will get a new bunch of questions um, which you with the information given here and if you look if you revise the lecture and look at this video you will have a fair go at answering them okay thank you